Thank you very much, Mr. High Representative. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to the coordinators and the rapporteur, as well as the shadow rapporteurs, for initial round of questions. And then I'd like uh, to give you the floor again to reply. Obviously, I would call on the example given just now and respect their speaking time. I'd like to start with Mr. Bilchik for the e European People's Party. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, very good afternoon, Representative Mr. Burrell. It's very good to see you in the committee, although I do have to say at the start, uh, it is uh, somewhat regrettable that we only have an hour for the exchange, and I hope uh, you will come back to our committee uh, for more questions and answers and do so on a regular basis, because indeed, disinformation and foreign interference are a huge challenge for Europe, for our democracies, but also for our foreign policy. Uh, let me recall uh, that in the hearing, in 2019, uh, you underlined that this information is a weapon and we have to invest a lot to fight it. And my question is, uh, what is the investment that you plan to push politically, but also practically uh, throughout the rest of your mandate? Uh, what will be the borrow legacy when it comes to the fight of, uh, against this information? Number of the tools uh, and instruments you've mentioned, uh, such as TRICOM uh, and uh, the uh, external action services uh, activities, they have been already in the pipeline. So what will be the edit uh, force uh, which we can expect uh, also from uh, uh, your mandate in this regard. In particular, I'm uh, pleased that you mentioned uh, the challenges we are facing in the neighborhood, uh, in the Western Balkans, in the Eastern neighborhood. Uh, my question is uh, how much of this uh, is and will be the topic of political discussions, especially in council, among the member states, uh, in the FAC. It's good that the European Council has uh, taken a clear note and sent a clear signal. But what about uh, the uh, European diplomacy and the European diplomacies collectively? Um, finally, let me pick up on a specific point, uh, which also uh, ties to uh, your visit uh, to Russia. And uh, uh, let me ask you uh, uh, broadly and specifically, broadly, uh, what lessons learned uh, will you take from your trip to Russia so it's not misused uh, in any similar way in the future uh, for the spread of this information? And my last question is uh, on the Western developments of, of uh, the vaccines. They have been under heavy attack from Russia, especially right now, uh, uh, through the spread of disinformation manipulated campaigns. What steps will you take uh, to really fight this? Uh, because this is our collective European interest. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Majorino, for the SND. For the SND. Prenez la parole. You have the floor. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. I wanted to ask a general question and then a more specific one to our guest. My question is, how is the diplomatic scene uh, evolving uh, because of these interferences. The fact that this interference is taking place, uh, it means, uh, does this, is this implied any changes in uh, diplomatic activity? What countermeasures are being taken? Then the specific question, uh, here we are referring to the role of Russia and China's attempt uh, with uh, hostile actions and things we have to combat, basically, or block. So I wanted to know from you, are there any attempts that others have, other countries have seen? I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, uh, the Emirates. Uh, what's your view of this? Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Monsieur le Représentant. Thank you very much, Chairman. Mr. High Representative, you talked about hybrid threats, but I don't think we should be talking about hybrid threats. We're talking about hybrid attacks, because what, that's what's happening at the moment. Now, that's important not just to document them, but also to dissuade and make sure that the perpetrators pay a high price for these acts. Are you going to extend the mandate... Uh, for STRATCOM, for example, for the southern neighbourhood, 
when it comes to public communication that needs to be bolstered. You often talk about Team Europe, but in this Team Europe there's always one actor missing, and that's the European Parliament. I would like the resolutions, the reports from this Parliament that are sent to uh, the attention of people outside the Europe are translated by the delegations in the European Union. We're talking about the strategic compass. What collective acts of solidarity do you intend to implement to help a member state that is under hybrid attack? For example, under Article 42.7, which specific acts would you like to develop with uh, certain people, including allies, including Australia. Australia is an example of a country that's developed some good practices. I'm also worried about CSDP missions, and I'd like to know how uh, you're going to make sure that uh, disinformation attacks will stop because they're undermining these missions. And also on the institutions themselves, the EU institutions. What about cyber security there? How are you going to do more? You said we need to speak in more specific terms. So I'd like to hear how you intend to act in more specific terms. Stop. Thank you, Mr. Jostu, for the ID group. Thank you, Chair. I'd also like to uh, greet Commissioner uh, Borrell. Now, as you know, in Italy, uh, this is a very difficult period in time due to the pandemic and the economic crisis. Now, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of disinformation and um, interference from foreign governments. And we've seen the reports from the Secret Services have shown that, that they are uh, Chinese interests on Italian assets. Now, this really concerns us. And as in, in a post-pandemic uh, situation such as the one we're going through now, it, it makes it very worrisome. Now, I have two questions. I want to know whether you have any knowledge of any foreign interests on uh, um, strategic assets, Italian and European strategic assets. And I'd like to know also about the structures and lobbies and whether there's any attempt of pressures to be brought to bear on the officials of the uh, external service uh, uh, staff from uh, foreign um, governments. Thank you. Madame Gregorova, vous avez la parole. Ms. Gregorova for the Greens. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, welcome, Mr. Borrell. I am happy you could join our committee today. I vividly remember your first hearing here when you applied for this position, and you have actually been repeatedly asked about the threat of disinformation, yet you either avoided it or talked about Mr. Hogan's involvement. And as Mr. Hogan is not in his position anymore, I do hope you came to terms with the responsibility of securing the European Union against the hybrid war included. As hope is in our line of work not enough, though, uh, I would like to ask you three short questions. Uh, how are you reflecting in your decisions the fact that we are facing such threats? What did you do so far in your diplomatic actions to subdue Russia's and Chinese hybrid war with the member states? And how do you plan to support the work of this committee specifically? Thank you very much. Thank you. Madame Melbard for the group ECR. You have the floor. Madame Melbard, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Borrell, for being with us. Uh, I, first of all, I, I would also like to join uh, my voice to the uh, representative of EPP asking you on uh, the lessons learned from your visit to Moscow. Uh, on the occasion of your visit to Moscow, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has even opened an official account on TikTok, where in the first video your praise for Sputnik vaccine was confronted with Alexei Navalny's critical remarks. So I, I really wonder how do you how did you prepare for this uh, visit and uh, what should you do differently in building diplomatic relations with Russia? And then uh, two other questions: uh, giving the role uh, an independent media and uh, uh, base in uh, combating disinformation and building a civil society. 
so uh, I believe we should prioritize more the support to the media uh, freedom uh, by uh, significantly increasing political and financial support to quality journalism and media literacy in the neighborhood uh, regions in Western Balkan. I think in particular uh, we all are worried about uh, think, uh, uh, processes, uh, what going on in Belarus where Russia is uh, taking uh, more control over uh, Belarus information space. How, how do you plan to ensure that support to the media sector is an integral part of the EU's foreign policy? And uh, uh, what have you done so far to strengthen um, or upgrade the status of the Stratcom task force, uh, including by providing with appropriate staffing and multi-annual funding? Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Pineda. You have the floor. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank Mr. Borrell, too. I won't, I'd be, I won't be saying what the others are saying. Uh, here we're looking between uh, hostile act stakeholders and friendly uh, uh, people. And we start talking about Russia and China, and uh, Russia's are using the lack of... Uh, um, a lack of masks or saying that the vaccine is harmful, but we've got to see also what other campaigns are taking place on Facebook and on Twitter. There's a lot of information that we don't get. And Mr. Borrell, I, I'm not going to ask anything, but we've got to stop just stop uh, putting a patch on this new type of uh, Cold War. We've got to have a diplomatic action and we've got and I suggest that we stop this and we start going the diplomacy route and really negotiating. Thank you for EPP. Madam Kanyeti, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. High Representative, uh, thank you very much that you are meeting with us and I will immediately shoot out my questions. First about East Stratcom Task Force and their role in the fight of disinformation um, uh, for promoted by Kremlin. Should it be strengthened with further staff? financial resources and broader mandate. My next question is, uh, we all welcome your statement that uh, the European Union needs uh, a new strategy uh, for with Russia. What are the implications of this potential change of strategy? What steps do you envision uh, to making the EU's posture more robust and how you will manage to deal with the uh, council and member states who resist um, the, uh, this more robust approach. And my last question is about, could you elaborate more on the role of the EU in resilience building and counter disinformation efforts in the countries of EU neighborhood? Uh, not only I, but I believe that many of us we are highly concerned that the failure to support civil society and independent media in these countries can spill over into broader geopolitical consequences, which we in the European Union will regret. Thank you, Mr. High Representative. Thank you. For the group SND, Mr. So the SND, SND, Mr. Shida has the floor. Uh, dear High Representative, uh, thank you also for joining us in this meeting because it's an extremely complicated question because to do foreign policy and on the other side, of course, uh, also to speak about that we have uh, witnesses also worked out here in the committee that uh, there is strong linkage and interference from foreign forces like Russia, but also others, and that we also see that, for example, the extreme right in Europe is taking money or advices also from this country in order to work against our uh, democracy here. So uh, my question to you is, of course, uh, 
uh, not only on Russia, because the uh, situation already is quite complicated, and I think it is important always to go there and discuss with them, but also with the other countries. What can foreign policy uh, do also, uh, and is it already a good first step if we speak about it? Because uh, visibility is already a first step uh, to combat these uh, processes. Merci, Madame von Kramen. Thank you, Madam von Kramen Talbeidel for the Greens. And thanks a lot to the High Representative. Uh, I fully share your analysis. Uh, even you have left out some of the cyber attacks when we start with Estonia, for example, in seven, Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 14, until now, France in 15, and Germany, the US 16, the United Kingdom with the Brexit. 17 in France again, 2018 United States, Poland, Venezuela, and Germany again, this time the Bundestag. So this is a long list of cyber attacks, mainly attributed uh, to Russia and targeting predominantly the European Union and its closest allies. This list is far from being complete. Mr. Burrell, during your uh, trip to Moscow recently, did you demand the clear explanation from your colleague, Mr. Lavrov, on frequent and well-documented cyber attacks on Russian Federation, uh, of Russian Federation on the EU? And if not, why not? Because your press conference uh, showed a little bit, uh, let's say, a strange behavior, uh, which we didn't really know where you stand. And do you believe that such attacks that intend to erode our democracy and destabilize our union could be retaliated by us with harsh measures, including personal and sectoral sanctions on Putin's regime. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Avant Thank you. So before we give you the floor, Mr. Borrell, there's a question that takes up part of the comments made. We're all aware that the regimes that decide these hybrid, they launch these hybrid attacks uh, against our democracies gain something. Now, what do they risk losing? So, in other words, which, what measures have you taken? What did you intend to do? What type of agreement did you refuse to sign because our democracies are under attack? Could you give us a specific advance of what the Kremlin, for instance, is losing in uh, financing cyber attacks against our institutions or by financing uh, certain European political parties? What do they lose? What have they got to lose? That You have the floor. Mr. Borrell, you have the floor. Can you press the speak button, please? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for so many questions. I will try to answer them uh, in a comprehensive way because it would be impossible to go one, one by one. Well, most of the questions has been related to the mandate uh, that we have here at the European External Action Service. And uh, if I was going to extend the mandate, well, <laughs> it's not me who is going to extend my mandate. I receive one mandate. So uh, in order to have a, a broader mandate, it's the European Council who has to give me more mandate. I cannot attribute to myself new mandate. The mandate, uh, everybody understands, come from someone who is in the capacity to mandate you to do something. And, uh, for example, today we don't have any kind of mandate to study this information about China. We have a specific mandate about Russia, the Western Balkans, and we work in, in broader areas and with respect to other subjects, but not because we have a specific mandate, because we believe that there is a problem and we try to face it. But uh, we have very, very, very little resources to fight against this information coming from China, for example. I, I'm not going to tell you how many resources we have, because it's evidently something confidential, but uh, not the required ones. And we don't have the required ones because we don't have a mandate. Uh, it would be very happy to have a mandate and the resources needed to implement this mandate. And 
the lessons learned from uh, my visit to Russia is that uh, we have to be prepared to widespread information on the same level and with the same scale that they do. Because immediately after the, the end of this visit, the machinery started producing a lot of this information, a lot of attacks, a lot of presenting things the, in a biased way and explaining from their point of view with a, a lot of uh, half truth, half lies that our disinformation system were identifying and widespreading. But you know, it's, to disseminate with this information, it's most easier that counterattack this disinformation. It's very much easier to say something which is not true, that explain to the people that the thing that they learn or they listen or they see were not true and explain why. So for sure, we have to be prepared not to wait to counter the disinformation, but to prepare information, not to be in a reactive way answering, but to react quicker. Um, our first reaction was uh, uh, done through communications, written communications, thoroughly understanding communication, but too late. And the battle of narrative, you have to react quickly, immediately, and for that you have to be prepared. But unhappily, we don't have a farm trolls. We don't have uh, all the infrastructure needed to produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of messages from different sources in a very well orchestrated manner. We don't have this tool. We don't have this tool. We don't have the capacity to produce massively information presenting our view. What do we have? Is the capacity on a stationary basis to respond the disinformation that we detect in the networks. And you have received some reports that we produce, for example, analyzing very de in on detail one press conference of Minister Lavrov. Immediately after my visit, he went to produce several press conferences and on these press conferences disseminated a lot of this information. Well, our services studied this disinformation and provide an answer, a reply, explaining the reality. And I'm sure you received this, this report. But it's an answer. It's not the same thing that attacking. We were not prepared to, from the beginning, present our view, present our approach, present our truth. And when you have to answer, well, you know, we say that the one who throws the first stone throws two stones. We had to be prepared to immediately to present our narrative. And for certainly, we were not. To extend the mandate to the South uh, will be also very heavy, but someone has to give me this mandate. To incorporate the European Parliament on the Team Europe, not only member states and the European institutions, but also the Parliament, I think is a, is a good proposal, and the resolutions of the Parliament about this information, about anything, have to be uh, present on the website of our information campaign and in our the, on the website of our of our delegations uh, the attacks to our missions how can i do in order to avoid these attacks how can i avoid an attack <laughs> the, the thing that they can do is to respond to the attack but to avoid an attack how can i make that Russia, for example, doesn't disseminate this information against our military missions in, in Central African Republic. I cannot prevent them from doing that. What I can do, and that what we can do, we try to do, is to counter this attack, to respond, to give the right thing, explaining people that what has been said is not true and present the real facts and figures of reality. But uh, to, uh, to make Russia not to attack, why should they? Which advantage they take? A lot. Which pay the price? Very little. Very, very little. And that's why we have to work on a way of not only counterattacking, on rebuting, or explaining what is the real facts and figures, but to make them to pay a price. By the time being, what do we have? We have a systems of sanctioning for uh, cyber attacks. We have it, and we have used it. And 
mainly against uh, Russian entities, against cyber attacks when we detect and we can attribute, we can say these attacks come from such a place and it's very difficult to identify where the attack comes from. The most difficult thing on this kind of battle is attribution to determine who did it. And in cyber attacks, you can understand, it's not so easy. But in some cases, we have identified and we have put sanctions. How can we sanction people who disseminate this information? Well, there is nothing in international law that can be automatically used. We have to look for a system in which we could determine which is the damage created and which is the proportionate answer. Today, we don't have this tool. And it's not so easy to elaborate a tool that can be used in order to make, to pay a price or to suffer the consequences of this information. I would be very happy if I could have it. But by the time being, it's not, uh, it's not so easy to implement. We have sanctions, and we do sanctions when we know someone that has been doing specifically something that we consider attending event human rights, rule of law, uh, the basis of our uh, toolbox for sanctioning people like we are doing at that moment, we are doing at that moment, it will be ready by the end of the week for the people who were uh, engaged on the Navalny case. And these are sanctions for a specific, not this information, but actions. But uh, to make people to pay about this information, you have to identify how they proceed, which is the value of the action, and by the time being, we have to create these tools, but we don't have them. Nobody has them. Nobody has them. Our strategic interests and the influence of external powers over the civil servants of the external action service. Uh, Marco Driosto asked for it. I am sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know any case of external actors putting influence or making our civil servants to work for their interests and not for the interests of the service. If you have some examples, please uh, tell me. Another question that has been raised is about the uh, Middle East and North Africa region. And certainly, we are talking about the East because this information comes from Russia. Then we talk about Western Balkans. We talk about the Eastern neighborhood. Now let's look to the South. Certainly, this information is challenging the main region. It's a threat with direct security and stability implications. In the MENA region, we have various actors, both from the region and from outside, which are increasingly using this information and hybrid threats to advance their foreign policy agenda. We have a specific task force, the STRATCOM Force for the South, who is working on trying to adopt a positive approach that is more efficient than a counter-negative approach. It's not only to debunk and to counter-attack the disinformation, we have to provide our information. We have to disseminate our narrative. We have to be more proactive. Well, Drossi, you know, is, is not the only player in town in the main region. We cannot have a, a, a region-wide and one-size-fits-all for purpose. That's why this uh, task force for the South has been adopting a country-to-country -country approach to understand the local specificities and adapt our responses. And we need also to to start to work on our regional spokesperson communication in Arabic, based in Beirut, because the, the language is very important. The value of the language is very important, and we used to use our languages, but we have to work in Arabic also, because if we want to reach the Arab world, which is more and more targeted by the disinformation coming from Russia, we have to use its own language. Uh, someone, uh, yes, uh, Von Krasen asked about uh, the, if I talk uh, with Mr. Lavrov about cyber attacks. For sure, in the, in the discussion that we have, we talk about two things, mainly our concern 
about the Navalny case, and that clearly it was a, a example of how Russia is not fulfilling their commitments from the Human Rights Convention of the Council of Europe, and then on what our relations are not working, on what they can be working better. And one typical case in which our relations are not working is disinformation and cyber attacks and hybrid attacks. And we put, you know, every time we've been talking with the Russian authorities about it, the answer is immediately, oh, we do nothing. Oh, what, what are you talking about? We do nothing. What do you say, disinformation? Well, it must be some private firms. It must be some private agent. You know, the Russian government doesn't have any kind of influence on this thing you talk about. Yes, this is always the same answer, and there's always the same claim from our side. And I have to remember then that the, some Russian entities have been uh, sanctioned using our cyber attack sanction toolbox. But for sure we talk about it, about uh, all the issues that bother us in our relation, mainly in uh, the case of human rights and in the case of the bilateral relations. For sure this issue was not in the press conference, but uh, we talk a lot about everything that Russia does and creates problems for us, and we are ready to react against it. And the first thing that we have to react is to ask them to stop this kind of war if they want to sit in the table and to talk about how to improve our relations. It was clear that there was not a lot of interest on improving our relations, and for the Russian authorities, if you come and you talk to them and you tell to them eye to eye, what do you think about the Lavrov case and the lack of respect for human rights in Russia and the lack of political freedom, they immediately cut brutally any kind of communication about any other issue. But uh, Russia is there, it's not going to disappear, and we will continue having to, to keep in touch and to reach out with Turkey on issues in which we have interest. It's in our interest to try to look from some agreements for them in selective issues. Uh, Multi-annual funding. Well, it's, it's, sorry, I am not uh, a budget authority. I use the budget that you approve. So if you want to talk about multi-annual funding, it's better me that should ask to you, what kind of multi-annual funding are you ready to provide to me? Because you are the budget authority. I am not the budget authority. I am using the resources that you allocate to me, and I have to be very thankful because in the past you have been, the Parliament has been very much interested on providing funding in order to develop our disinformation activities. I, I would appreciate a lot if you could continue doing so because if we want to extend our activities to China and to the rapidly increasing level of activities that we have to face, for sure, we will need more resources. I am not going to explain it publicly, but if you want one day in, in a restricted session, I can explain you the resources that we have in order to face this information coming from Russia, but sorry, from China. I am I'm sure you will you will recognize that there are very, very, very little. About, about the cybersecurity of the institu European institutions, I am not in charge of it. I am not in charge of ensuring cyber security of the European institutions. There are colleagues in the college who are in charge of it. And there is a strategy approved by the college about how to deal with the cyber security. But um, I'm sorry, you asked to me to think that in which uh, I, am not, uh, I am not in charge. I know that we have a problem with it. And I know that uh, we don't have a... Uh, as, we don't secure our communications enough. And you remember that uh, some time ago we had the interference of a hacker that came into a meeting of the Foreign Affairs Council. Well, it came because some, one minister put on a Twitter visible the call to enter. But anyway, we need to improve our security in order to face cyber uh, security attacks, cyber attacks. But it is not uh, my my direct responsibility. What I would, what I would like to let behind me as a, an heritage or a specific thing to do. 
Well, I would like to extend the activities about to other agents with a specific mandate and adequate resources. Not only Russia, but also with China and others. Someone has been asking about who are the other. Well, Syria, there are Turkey, there is ISIS. Uh, the three examples that we identify as new providers of cyber, of cyber attacks. And secondly, I would like to be able to set up something that the president asked at the end to pay the price, to pay the price that these kind of activities could not be for free. But this has to be done at the international level. This is something that is, has no borders. It's very difficult to imagine that we can do it by ourselves. But to be able to extend the, the scope, to extend the number of uh, people that are attacking us in order to give an adequate answer and to have tools in order to retaliate or to make to pay a price or to sanction, whatever you want to call it, I think that this is one of the things that uh, I should be working, we should be working, and uh, to let us... Uh, an asset for the future. You can need, Ms. Kainete talk about uh, the new strategy with Russia. Well, the new strategy with Russia, you allow me to say, is not exactly the, the subject of this, uh, of this meeting, but I, I don't dare to, I, I don't mind to talk about it because we have been working on it. And for me, it's clear that in the framework of the five guiding principles, we, shall, we should use three verbs. With Russia, we have to contain, I know that it is a word that comes from the Cold War and people are a little bit afraid of using it, but we have to contain Russia, but it puts pressure on us. We have to push back Russia, but it infringes international law or human rights, and we have to engage with Russia in issues in which, as I said, we have an interest in doing so. So the, uh, and the strategy for Russia in the framework of the five guiding principles who are perfectly, perfectly up to date is to push back, to contain, and to engage. And this is what uh, the European uh, Union Council will have to discuss when uh, on the next uh, meeting of March, I think, they will have to study which is the good uh, answer to the attitude, the, attitude uh, the very aggressive attitude of Russia. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Représentant.